All right, I'd like you to go to 2 Kings 23. We are studying Josiah. We noted in 2 Kings 22 that he had a personal commitment at age 8, walking a straight road. We also noticed that uh, by age 16, he was persistent in worship. He was seeking God in 2 Chronicles 34.3. We saw that by age 20, he was purging his people in practical purification. We saw that at age 26, he was restoring the temple in 2 Kings 22.3-7. through 7. We saw that uh, all the while, he was championing the poor. I don't know if you caught this. I said it so quickly, I'm not sure if it was sen uh, sensible to you. But right next to 22, 3 through 7, write this verse. Jeremiah 22, 15 and 16. Jeremiah 22, 15 and 16. And if you check those out, it will say that Josiah championed the poor. He acted on behalf of those who were weak and were poor and took care of them. So what we have is a guy who has a personal commitment to God, a worship life, a purification of his kingdom, priorities, moving forward with Josiah's story. Beyond his personal work, King Josiah also had a full work life. In fact, in 23.1, he, he had um, in mind, the word I use is unity, he built a team to execute God's directives in 23, 1 and 2. In 23, 3, he explained the word of God to the people that he led. In 4 through 7, he had piety. That is, he took bold moves against the wrongs of the past. He was gracious in verses 8 and 9 with those who he had to rehabilitate. In verse 10, he deliberately destroyed the remnants of those things that were abhorrent to God. In verse 11 to 15, he took apart the sacred cows of things, <laughs> pun intended, sacred cows of, of things that bothered God. In 16 to 18, he, um, he maintained the dignity and respect of those who had walked with God before him. And in 19 and 20, he shut out and cut out those who needed to be removed from society because of their defiance and rebellion. When you pick it up in 21, 22, and 23, he moves the people on from the wrong celebrations to the right celebrations and puts in place real progress, moves them from wrong celebrations to right celebrations. In 24 and 25, he asked people to personalize the national changes by dealing with their homes, facing personal issues, personal purity. Now, with such an excellent resume, somebody would expect a great finish to his story. You'd go, well, I don't expect the sputtering end but look at verses 28 to 34 of chapter 23. 2 Kings 23, 28 to 34. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the kings of the chronicles, uh, chronicles of kings of Judah? In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. King Josiah went up to meet him, and when Pharaoh Necho saw him, he killed him at Megiddo. What? We've been, we've been dealing with this guy who's had this really good run. He's been a really delightful person to study with all of these good characteristics. What was his big problem? 31 years he's on the throne, and in verse 29, he takes on a fight that's not his fight. That's his mistake. He took on a fight that wasn't his fight. He decided, here's Egypt going to fight Assyria, and he's going to get in the middle. And that's just dumb. You take on fights that God didn't ask you to take on, and you will get hurt in ways you have not planned on. And in verse 29, it says at the end, he went to, to a place where he didn't belong, and he suffered a fate that wasn't what he lived. The guy lived well. He made a bad choice. But the bad choice he made was a critical one. You don't play Russian roulette. One of the chambers has a bullet. And he chose the one with the bullet. So, interestingly enough, he sowed a great deal of godly freedom, and we would expect him to reap a, reap a legacy that wasn't... Um, as tainted as the one he will reap. Look at verse 30. His servants drove his body in a chariot from Megiddo and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb. Then the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, anointed him and made him 
king in his place uh, of his father. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king. He reigned three months in Jerusalem. His no mother's name was Hamutah, the daughter of Je Jeremiah of Libna. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. Pharaoh Necho imprisoned him at Riblah in the land of Hamat, that he might not reign in Jerusalem. And he imposed on the la land a fine of 100 talents of silver and a talent of gold. Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the place of Josiah, his father, and changed his name to Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim. Uh, but he took Jehoahaz away and brought him to Egypt, and he died there. Now, you have this story. What was the problem? How could such a good man end so badly? Remember this. No matter how long you've walked with God, you need to seek him today. Yesterday's obedience doesn't cover today's problems. Okay? So the greater clue to the lesson is not found here. Whenever I can't find it in 2 Kings, where do I go? 2 Chronicles. So I want to take a look now at 2 Chronicles 35, verses 20 to 27. And here you're going to spot five problems that Josiah had when he didn't recognize the, see, the, the need to seek God for that day. Look, you can get to the point where you're walking with God for so long you're riding the coattails of yesterday's victories. And you're not thinking through today. You're not looking at it and saying, what do I need today from you, Lord? And believe me, it will be a challenge in your life. The longer you walk with God, the more you will just come to feel comfortable in it. And when we feel comfortable, we don't think about what we're doing. And so... I get to verse 20 of 2 Chronicles 35. 2 Chronicles 35, verses 20 to 27. And in verse 20, it says, After all this, when Josiah had set the temple in order, Necho, king of Egypt, went up to fight at Carchemish on the Euphrates. And Josiah marched out to meet him in battle. But Necho sent messengers to him, saying, What quarrel is there between you and me, O king of Judah? Is it not you I am attacking at this... It is not you that I am attacking at this time, but the house with which I am at war. God has told me to hurry, so stop opposing God, who is with me, or he will destroy you. Josiah, however, would not turn away from him, but disguised himself to engage him in battle. He would, he would not listen to what Necho had said at God's command, but went to fight him on the plain of Megiddo. Archers shot King Josiah, and he told his officers, Take me away, I am badly wounded. So they took him out of the chariot, put him in the other chariot that he had, and brought him to Jerusalem where he died. He was buried in the tomb of his fathers, and all Judah and, Ju and Jerusalem mourned for him. Jeremiah composed laments for Josiah. And to this day, all men and women singers commemorate Josiah in the laments. These became a tradition in Israel and are written in the laments. <clears throat> and I want you to notice verse 25. They're written down in Lamentations. Okay, these are laments that are sung by Israel. Are these the five that we have, the book of Lamentations? It could well be. So you might write next to it, Lamentations question mark. It, these may be the reason why we have the Lamentations we have. Okay, it's also possible that the Lamentations we have are about the fall of Jerusalem and that the, the, they started with a lament over Josiah and were adjusted by Jeremiah, as some, some songwriters do, making a second change to the song. <clears throat> Verse 26, The other events of Josiah's reign and acts of devotion, according to what is written in the law of the Lord, all the events from beginning to end are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. I want you to look at the verses we just read, because I spotted five problems there. First, in verse 20, Josiah completed setting things in order that God had told him to do. And that's fine, but pride set in. Where do I see the problem of pride? When God's used you to do things for him, we can easily get to the place where we believe that we, his work is defined through us. What we are doing defines the work of God. Let me tell you where you hear this. You hear this from people who love their local church and say, we're the only ones really preaching the word of God in this town. That's typically an arrogant statement of people who are really on board with what they're on board with. Frankly, you don't even know what's going on everywhere else in town. And the competitive spirit didn't come from God. So uh, all I can say is 
We look down our noses at somebody else because we've experienced God's work in us and we know how he works. And so we get this kind of spiritual stuffiness and arrogance about our walk. I think that's the first problem. Second half of verse 20. Notice that Josiah reacted to the Mar army passing through his territory by arming for war and confronting Necho with an army. I think it's presumption. After pride came presumption. You know what's missing? Prayer. It doesn't say he sought God. Without prayer or seeking God, Josiah saw the surface situation and assumed he could read the depth of it because after all, God works through me. One of the problems of becoming competent that we've seen in the past is that you can start to believe you can see what you can't see. Get down to verse 21. I think Josiah believed um, that God was using him, and he disbelieved that Necho could ever hear from God, that Necho could be used by God to warn him off. And I really believe that he challenged that the Lord was with Necho, and any movement against him was, was, was disobedient. So here's what I think happened. I use the word preeminence. I, I think one could argue that Josiah, in the heat of the moment, forgot to go to the Lord concerning the situation, but Josiah's pride swelled to the belief that God could only use him. He wouldn't use some pharaoh from Egypt. That's like the world. Why would they know what to do? Remember that even a broken clock is right twice a day. And it's, it's very hard for us to see it. But when you're looking at the world, even an idiot who doesn't know God might be telling the, the truth. You know, just because they don't know God doesn't mean they can't tell you about the accident that's around the corner and tell you to slow down. They don't have to know spiritual things to know something that is a vital message from God for you. I think there was also in verses 22 and 23 pretense. He attempts trickery, and I think that's a pretense. Without a focus on seeking God and following God, we easily can justify anything. So he goes out there, and the ends begin to justify the means. He puts on a, a costume that's not his, and he begins a deception. If God calls you to go out and stand against evil, then you don't have to put on a costume. Okay, You can be who you are. The last one, I think, is in verses 24, 25, 26. I think Josiah's actions grieved believers like Jeremiah who were heartbroken by the loss. But here's the problem. Our actions can cause pain and suffering for more than we calculate. He went out there and he took on something that wasn't his to take on. And God cut him out of the story and it caused a lamentation so big that I think it becomes part of the Bible. Okay? All I'm saying is we have this wonderful story about this good guy. And what did he forget? The principle you hang over the end of his life is simple. It doesn't matter how long you walked with God, you got to walk again today. It's not your insight that God blesses. It's his presence that God blesses. And yes, your insights will seem astounding to others, but it will be because of God's presence. Don't put the insights ahead of the presence. Put the presence ahead of the insights, okay? And so you end up with this kind of awkward multiple people being swapped around for the throne thing by Necho, Pharaoh of Egypt. You can tell by now, we're in, by the way, the Battle of Carchemish was 609. So that is one of the most famous battles. If you go to uh, West Point, you would learn the Battle of Carchemish. This is a world-famous battle, and it's the one that Josiah dies in and not in the battle. He dies before the battle ever starts. Okay? So when we get down to about 609, 608, what we find is the next king, this will be the 17th of the king's uh, rulers, is Yehoahaz. He's also named in Chronicles Shalom, S-H-A-L-L-U-M. And you will see him in 2 Kings 23, 30 to 33, or 2 Chronicles 36, 1 to 4. This is a son of Josiah, and his name is Yehoahaz, or Shalom. And alongside of him, another brother named Yehoiakim, or Jehoiakim. You're going to have two guys who sound alike, Yehoiakim and Yehoiachin, Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin. They're not the same people.
we're accustomed to you having several names because we have a certain system that we use for names. In the Bible, there were many people that almost everyone had at least a designation of their primary name and a, a designation of, of their location or their craft or sometimes all three. Lydia, of, Lydia the seller of purple of Tiatira or Thyatira. Saul of Tarsus. Saul the king was Saul of Gibeah of Saul. And, and so you had these, like, they always have multiple names. Now, then add to that, they have nicknames. So Jeconiah is sometimes called Coniah, just a shortened form. Well, we have nicknames that are shortened forms. Then add to that, they have names of, how would I say this? Stardom, pen names, um, street names. Uh, and sometimes they're titles more than names. A lot of the names in the Bible in the Hebrew scriptures are not names at all. They're meanings. So Ruth, Reut, is friend. Is that her name or is that what she comes to be put written into the text to be because she's an example of a good friend? I, I don't know. I'm going to say, in absence of knowing, I'm just going to say that was her name. But we're left to that. And in many cases, it almost seems like by the end of the story, you can understand why the name was given at the beginning. The question is, was that always their name or was that what they came to be named? And, and, and you don't, when you hold the Bible literally, you don't want to squeeze it to say, therefore, you know, her name might have been, you know, Agnes, okay? But now by the Roman period, it takes on a completely different set of names. You have a, 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 a prenomen, nomen, and then a, a, a cognomen. And, and they're all different setups. And so you have different um, and then of course, women in the New Testament period didn't have names. Uh, there was only the, the name of the gens or the name of the family. So if you were from the Claudii, all the women in the family were named Claudia. So what if you had like a second sister? Then it was Claudia Major and Claudia Minor. And, and seriously, in the Roman period, women didn't have names. They, they didn't stand in their own names. So... Then what happens? Well, they pick up nicknames. Why? Because you, you're, it gets a little laborious in Latin to say Claudia, the oldest of the clan. You know what I mean? And so you just end up saying, yeah, that's Agnes. You know? and, and so everybody gets different names for lots of different reasons over time. Okay? Long answer to a short question. Okay, take a moment and let's look at some events that unfold very quickly in our lesson. I want to call this a late jump. And really, here's the thing. Um, even when it looks like it's too late, God will keep a door open to reach you. Now, don't delay, because the door will eventually close. But God's mercy often opens doors long after anybody else would close them. So I want you to see some events that happen. Go to 2 Kings chapter 23. Begin looking in verse 34. That's where I want to pick up my story. And in verse 34, it says, Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king uh, in the place of Josiah, his father, and changed his name to Yehoiakim. But he took Jehoahaz away and brought him to Egypt, and he died there. So you have a king that's installed who's there for a few months and then uninstalled and is replaced by Yehoiakim or Jehoiakim. Um, and, and interestingly enough, if you look at verse 31, back in verse 31, it offers you some, some name meanings. Yehoahaz means Yahweh has seized, Yahweh has, has grabbed, or Yahweh has placed. And it's funny because, because the story is going to be he's going to get seized and grabbed and thrown in jail. That's, that's why it's interesting. Yehoahaz is God has seized, and in... He's 23 years old when he became king. He reigns three months. His mother's name, Hamutal, is the word for maker of dew, like the dew fall in the morning. Hamutal, the maker of dew. And the daughter of Yah will rise. God will rise, Jeremiah. And she was from Libna. So things were going well for the believers under King Josiah. He was a man of integrity. 
He was sitting on the throne. They were watching the defilement of the kingdom cleaned up. People like Jeremiah were going, amen, we finally got the kingdom back. We're on the right track. We got a good guy in the, in the monarchy. Morality, propriety, justice is restored. And suddenly he goes off to battle and he's, he's gone. And what's interesting is a younger son was chosen and came in under a cloud. But the older son was yanked out of the position, and a younger son was put there. Some of the Senate committees probably got together and called for an independent council in Jerusalem and said, hey, something's fishy here, okay? Something's not right. Verse 32 says, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father had done. So there were unexpected changes in the administration, but there was now also a sense of disappointment of the followers of God. They just came out of this great period where things were going well. Now, the next thing they know, they've got an evil king doing evil again. Are we back to this? And then there was a public shaming by the world because Pharaoh Necho took the, the Jehoahaz captive in the Egyptian camp in Syria and charged the people with a graduated tax for his, employ, uh, his imprisonment. Literally, he took the guy off the throne, put him in jail, and made the people pay a huge tax for the king's uh, living expenses while he's in jail. Now, that's not what it went to, but that's what it, he said it was. And... The older son of Josiah, would he be a better king? So he installs the one who was passed over. Now, everybody pauses for a moment of blind hope. They have a pagan king and higher taxes, but, but maybe, maybe it'll be better. But wait a minute. This king was installed by Pharaoh Necho. Why do you suppose the people installed the younger king and not the, old, the younger son and not the older one to be king to begin with? What do you suppose they knew about the older one? See, after years under Josiah, the people's standard for being ruled was raised. Their understanding of truth was raised. And they weren't going to be duped into just putting the oldest guy on the throne. So they said, pick the one who has the right heart. But no sooner does he get in, he's out and he's replaced. And by the way, he doesn't have the right heart. And they're looking at it and they're going, imagine you're living at that time. And they roll one candidate in and he's right in front of you and you're going, well, at least he comes with the right credentials. He's going to be good for the country. He gets in and right away he's not good for the country. And then you no sooner catch up to that and he's yanked out of the office and somebody else is thrust in it. And now you're going... This stooge put up by Pharaoh, how are we ever going to have anybody who runs the country well? And then what's interesting is Jehoiakim starts up as a foreign puppet on the throne. Look at verse 36. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. His mother's name was Zebedah, which means the, um, and by the way, that's the same name as Zebedee later on the household of Zebedee in the New Testament. Zebedah is a word um, for one who gives, a giving one. His mother's name was a giving one. And daughter of Padiah, that is Yahweh has ransomed. And she was from Ramah or Ramah. And he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his fathers had done. Now you got a crony king and he does bad. You just went from a long period of things going well and bam, now we're back in it. 24-1. Can't pick up the story. Now we go, 24-1, here's my words for it. From bad to worse, okay? During Jehoiakim's Yeho reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar means Nebo, protect the standing stones on my border, okay? During Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded the land, and Jehoiakim became a, his vassal for three years. But then he changed his mind and rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. Now, wait a minute. You got a guy who's installed by this side. Another guy comes in, cleans his clock. Now he's a vassal for him, and he's waffling back and forth. What would make him think that he could turn against Nebuchadnezzar? He had seen another world power that was strong. What did he see? He was installed by Egypt. So he's actually looking backwards going, you know what? You might think you're something Babylon, but... Egypt is going to beat you up. 
and he makes a terrible mistake. Now, this is a guy who's got troubles from every direction. He's brought under Babylonian rule, eventually rebels, and leads the neighboring nations to, to pummel and plunder under the sponsorship of a new dominant world power. And the writer explains why God allows this to happen. Now, here we are, bad rulers, high taxes, plundering from every direction. We are sick of it all, and we are praying for relief. And I want you to see what's happening, because we're almost finished with this kingdom. What are godly people praying for? Oh, God, we have such bad leaders. Oh, God. You remember, it's like Havacook. You remember? Oh, you think it's bad? That's okay. I got people that will clean up your mess. But when they come, they'll destroy and rip down everything. What? God, in wrath, remember mercy. You're not going to use bad people to hurt our bad people because they're not even Jewish bad people. And God says, yeah, I'm not really making a distinction there. Now take a look, verse 2, 24, 2. The Lord sent ba Babylonian, uh, Aramean, Moabite, and Ammonite raiders against him. He sent them to destroy Judah in accordance with the word of the Lord proclaimed by his servants, the prophets. Surely these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command in order to remove them from his presence because of the sins of Manasseh and all that he had done, including the shedding of innocent blood. For he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood and the Lord was not willing to forgive. As for the other events of Jehoiakim's reign and all that he did, are they not all written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Jehoiakim rested with his fathers, and Jehoiakim, his son, succeeded him as king. Wait a minute. I thought God forgave Manasseh. So tell me what those verses are about. Somebody help me here. I mean, he repented, right? God restored him, right? The problem with a public figure that leads people to sin is after he stops, they keep going. So even though Josiah will come and try to cleanse it out of the hearts of people, it's still there. People still think it's an acceptable way to think. The problem in our country is every time we get a conservative leader who focuses on the economy, they forget that the slippage that happened in the last two leaders was moral. We never fix the morality. We just go back and attack the economy. The moral bar keeps dropping while we keep trying to pay more attention to the dollar. They did the same thing. They didn't go back and fix it up. Now, Who's the prophet you would turn to if you were Yehoiakim or Yehoiakim? Who's the active prophet in the background here? Jeremiah. So let's look at Jeremiah for a minute. I want you to step off of 24, 2 through 5, and right next to it, Jeremiah 22, 11 to 23. Jeremiah 22, 11 to 23. Okay, and now a word of news from God through Jeremiah. Forget the king that got carted off. He ain't coming back. He's going to die in that prison. Now we're done. Forget it. He cannot and will not help you. Verse 13, nice and loud, someone. Woe to him who builds his house without righteousness and his upper rooms without justice who uses his neighbor's services without pay and does not give him his wages. Now I want to talk to the new guy. The other guy's in prison and he's not coming back. But I want to talk to the new guy, Yehoiakim. Listen to me. I have some things for you to consider. If you cheat people to get personal luxuries, you are marked for destruction. That's what verse 13 says. Second, if you focus on extravagance instead of justice and righteousness, you are done for. Read 14. Who says I will build myself a roomy house with spacious upper rooms and cut out its windows, paneling it with cedar and painting it bright red? So don't you think for a moment, I'm not paying attention to what you build and who you build it for, okay? If you try to fight for economic status rather than righteousness and morality, forget your future. By the way, great sentence right there. If you try to fight for economic status rather than righteousness and morality, forget your future. That's verse 15. Do you become a king because you are competing in cedar? 
Do you really think you can build your way in opulence out of your morality? Because you can't. I'm going to tell you right now, if we vote in people who make our prosperity soar and they do not address our morality, we are finished as a nation. It won't make any difference whether we have the best economy ever. There are some nations who have had great economies but no morality. By the way, economics was pretty good under Hitler. Okay? So, you know, while you're liquidating people's assets, you always have a chicken in every pot. It's somebody else's chicken. The other thing he says is if you distance yourself from your godly heritage and its blessings, you're going to suffer a terrible end. Look at 15 in the middle. It says, did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. By the way, you get that, it is well. It is, it, it, then it was well with him. He pled the cause of the afflicted and the needy. Then it was well. <laughs> is, is not that what it means to know me, declares the Lord? Just a word from history here, God says. You know, uh, if you look back on your dad, he did really well. Why? Because he paid attention. By the way, another word of history. This one comes from a much more recent time. The highest glory of the American Revolution was this. It connected in one dissoluble bond the principles of civil government and the principles of Jesus Christ. That was John Quincy Adams. The principles of civil government and the principles of Jesus Christ. You'd get thrown out of office for saying that today. That, by the way, was in a letter to his eldest son, John Adams, after John Adams became the second president. If you turn against my word and my people, he says, I'm going to take your government from you. That's what 17 is. But your eyes and your heart are intent only upon your own dishonest gain and on shedding innocent blood and on practicing oppression and extortion. Now, lest this sound like some kind of theoretical shedding of blood and not a specific complicity in the wrongs of his day, Jeremiah gets very specific. Jeremiah 26 goes on and says this, Jeremiah 26, 20, that Jehoiakim had another prophet of God arrested and killed because of the prophetic words. Jehoiakim had his men drag Uriah back from Egypt to get him. They killed him and they did not allow his family to have the body. Do you see it? That's Jeremiah 26, verses 20 to 23. So here's the thing. He's not going to deal in honesty. He's not going to deal in righteousness. Remember the four gods of our age, fortune, fame, power, pleasure. And people will strive for them. But look what happens. The fame is destroyed. I read in verse 18, Therefore thus says the Lord in regard to Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they will not lament for him. Alas, my brother, alas, sister. They will not lament for him. Alas, for our master. Alas, for his splendor. He will be buried in a donkey's burial, dragged off and thrown beyond the gates of Jerusalem. So I guess what I would put next to verses 18 and 19 the way to not get known is stray from God. The way to not get known is stray from God. Don't think you're going to take God's name, live the opposite, and yet somehow be famous for God. That's not going to happen. By the way, not only was his fame crushed, but verses 20, 21, 22 say his fortune was crushed. All the financial allies and prosperity ties go, went, went down with him. That's why it, there's, a, there's a whole statement about uh, Lebanon and there's a statement about shepherds and uh, uh, what he's talking about is the economy. The economy sunk. Your fame is gone. Your economy is gone. And by the way, your power and pleasure are ruined as well. Look at verse 23. You who dwell in Lebanon nested in the cedars, how you will groan when the pangs come upon you, pain like woman in childbirth. Somebody's going to tell you it's coming, but when the troubles come, it's going to be swift and severe and too late. See, whenever a prophet uses the term childhood, childbirth, here's what he's saying. You'll feel it coming, but you won't be able to stop it. The image of childbirth is the same thing. By the way, even Jesus uses that for the coming of the tribulation period and says it's like, it's like the beginning birth pangs. You'll feel it coming, but you can't stop it. Okay? Watch the childbirth image in the prophets. It's a very, it's a very good one.
With all that bad news, I skipped the beginning of the prophecy. As the beginning of the prophecy, it's astounding in light of all that was going on that Jeremiah's plea to Jehoiakim was this, turn to God. Listen to verses 3 and 4 at the beginning of Jeremiah 22. He says, thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness. Deliver the one who has been robbed from the power of his oppressor. Also, do not mistreat or do violence to the stranger, the orphan, or the widow. Do not shed innocent blood in this place. For if you men will indeed perform this thing, then kings will enter the gates of, the ha of this house, sitting in David's place on his throne, riding in his chariots and on horses, even the king himself and his servants and his people. That's remarkable to me that after everything they had done, the Lord said, look, if you will just follow me, I will install stability back in the kingdom. Now, the reason I mention that to you, just I'm going to take a break in a minute, but the reason I mention that to you is this. He says it's bad and getting worse. If you will turn to me, I can turn the hands back of the clock. I want you to know that I don't know what the future for our own country is, but I do know that when people get up and say, that's it, it's gone too far, it's only, <laughs> it's never gone too far. God can always turn it around. If he can do it for Manasseh, he can do it for us. If he can say through Jeremiah that he could do it for Yehoiakim, he can do it for us. Don't get the idea, well, now we pass that legislation, that's it, it's over. That's not true. It's not true. All that is required is in the face of disobedience, what's the right result? What's the right uh, response? Repentance. And God just looks for a nation that will repent. That's all he looks for. That will drop to its knees and get out of its arrogance and decide that it needs him.